So, thank you, welcome everyone uh, to talk on Fishy Way and House here on about climate change. So, Fishy Way has 20 years of experience, is it, studying at the Institute of Buddhist Dialects? Do you guess you're going down, Charlotte? And yeah, about 19, yeah. 19, yeah. So, he's very knowledgeable and he's studied as well as so, Buddhist knowledge there. He used to do a lot on climate change and modern effects. That's why it's been tonight's talk. Maybe if you'd like to, you know, give you a little introduction to your talk, Miss Lawrence. Okay. Yeah, so, is that it, Jason? I mean, uh, Thomas? Yeah, I haven't got much on what he talks about here. So if you just so good evening everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. I don't know what the sound quality is like for you. Fingers crossed. I'll start off with um, the verses of refuge. Um, this is uh, just my own English thing so nothing for you to join in with but just a um, proper way to start. To Buddha, Dharma, and fine fellowship, I go for refuge till enlightenment. By my collections, giving, and so forth, may I reach Buddhahood for all beings' sake. To Buddha, Dharma, and fine fellowship, I go for refuge till enlightenment. By my collections, giving, and so forth, may I reach Buddhahood for all beings' sake. To Buddha, Dharma, and fine fellowship, I go for refuge till enlightenment. By my collections, giving, and so forth, may I reach Buddhahood for all being sake. Well, just to let you know, I don't think um, Thomas mentioned it. Um, this is a Nalanda Monastery, Nalanda Monastery in the south of France, that is. Nalanda Monastery International Broadcasting Service. Tonight we're broadcasting uh, um, uh, on behalf of Jammu and Buddhist Centre London, of course. So I'm very pleased to be invited. And, uh, you know, very grateful to be invited. Thank you very much. Um, you know, my theme then, climate disaster, Buddhas to the rescue. My name's uh, Kessie Tenzin Lozo. I think Thomas probably mentioned that. <laughs> anyway, uh, there's some faces I don't recognize. <laughs> Good. So um, I'm going to start off with a, a little um, quote I got, a little um, thing I found, which is um, very relevant. I'm going to have to read this one. So this is the uh, trans transcript of a radio conversation with a U.S. naval ship off the coast of Newfoundland in October 1995. And it was released by the Canadian Chief of Naval Operations on the 10th of October 1995. So this is a, a, a communication by radio, yeah? U.S. ship. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. Canadians, recommend you divert your course 15 degrees south to avoid a collision. U.S. ship, this is the captain of a U.S. Navy ship. I say again, divert your course. Canadians, no, I say again, you divert your course. U.S. ship. This is the aircraft carrier USS Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States Atlantic Fleet. We are accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers, and numerous support vessels. I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north. That's one five degrees north or countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of this ship. 
Canadians, this is the lighthouse, your call. So if you are, um, if you're steaming full, you know, if you're steaming towards a lighthouse, which is, uh, of course, um, sticking out on the top of a bunch of very big, heavy rocks. Uh, and then the guy in the lighthouse is communicating with you, indicating, advising a change of course. What would you do as the captain of that ship? Well, what answer are we going to give? Full steam ahead. We ain't changing no course. We're homo sapiens and femina sapienta. So that seems to be um, the response of, um, you know, uh, as members of Western civilization to the, the climate crisis. No change of course, full steam ahead. And yet we call ourselves Homo sapiens, Femina sapienta. Oh dear. Perhaps a better name will be Funky Monkey, eh? Yeah? Funky Monkey. So um, how do we get into this mess? That's what started interesting me. So um, we're going to start off the talk by uh, investigating that. So a little bit of history uh, uh, and prehistory and ancient history and back before history even began. So just, um, you know, uh, the best thing to do to find out, you know, what the best thing to do is, is to look at the situation in depth. So we're going back 4.5 billion years. Can we have the first picture, please, Jason? Yes, we're waiting for the first picture. No, that's the second picture. First picture. Yeah, that's the first picture. Yeah, that's it. So that's Earthrise 1968. So that's, um, you know, the first uh, time the Americans landed on the moon. So that gives you a little picture of our, uh, you know, our home, our blue boat sailing through uh, space. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so not much more to say about that one. Next one then. No, no, no. The next one is the one before. No, no. Yes. So that's number two. So that's just, you know, um, that's just the world on fire. So uh, that was taken in 2013 and there's been a lot more, as we know, a lot more worse uh, bushfires in Australia. Uh, more recently than that, you know, so that picture is quite, um, uh, you know, that, that's a quite a good emblem of um, the way our bluebird home is looking or beginning to look right now. But as I say, we're going to go back four and a half billion years. So the next picture, please, Jason. That one, yeah. So where's the caption? Uh, I put all captions on these, Jim. This is the one that I'm using, the uh, keynote slides in the shared folder. Uh, not worked then. Anyway, it's the right picture, just the, 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 um, the one I did had a, had a caption on it, but never mind. I just have to tell you what it is. Um, what to do anyway. So that's, um, that's called, they're called Hadian, Hadian uh, Earth, Hadian Era Earth. So that is when um, the Earth was um, formed, obviously. It's become a sphere, but it's, um, it's hardly cooled down at all. So how does the Earth form? It forms out of, you know, particles of dust and debris in space, so they say. I mean, nobody would be quite sure. You know, after the, after the appearance of the, of the Sun, there's loads of debris in orbit around the Sun, and somehow this debris, this dirt, you know, this dust, conglomerates to form the several planets that we know in the solar system. Uh, and, and 
okay, the earth forms out of this dust, but why is it red hot? I don't know. Why is, was the dust boiling hot when it, when, they all, when it all clumped together? Don't ask me. Anyway, it's cooling down. So that's, um, you know, four and a half billion years ago is the estimated, uh, you know, when, when the earth is born. But this might be some little time after that when it's sort of um, kind of... Um, Thank you, Jason. Yeah, lovely, lovely. Uh, and, and right about this time, um, another planet, which is a bit smaller than the Earth, perhaps, bumps into the Earth. You know, another, another planet bumps into the Earth, crashes into it, smashes it so badly that huge pieces of debris are again broken off from the Earth, and they fall on the Moon. So um, the moon, that's how the Moon seems to be formed from, you know, um, debris that's, that's blown off the Earth's surface by a, a huge impact of something, you know, about the size of Mars, they say. So um, that's uh, apparently a very fortunate circumstance because uh, the Moon helps, helps to stabilize Earth's orbit. So um, it made uh, things a bit easier for creatures trying to sort of set up home on, on Earth, that they had this stabilized orbit, uh, which was helped by presence of, you know, the gravitational kind of a pull from the moon. Okay, next slide please, uh, Jace. Jason. Jason. Is it not changing? No. Let me try something else. There we go. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so the, the, the last screen we saw was, was the Earth in a very hot mode. Okay, that was a uniquely hot mode because that was when the Earth is just um, um, cooling down and you know, just not far, not long from being born. But then since then, you know, um, the Earth has gone through so many um, um, changes. So much uh, that uh, even at one stage it looked like this, a snowball, snowball earth. So why did it look like that? Well, um, people theorize it is because of the presence of life. Um, you know, um, life began in the oceans. So there's um, a long period of, uh, you know, um, very, very small, minute uh, microorganism, microbe style life, you know, before anything bigger than something almost invisible um, comes to be known on Earth. And uh, some of those creatures floating in the ocean began photosynthesizing. Photosynthesizing. Uh, so that means that in order to photosynthesize, they take carbon dioxide out of the air, just as uh, your, your ordinary tree does to this day. You know, they take water from the ground, carbon dioxide from the air, and through the power of the sun, they bond the, the carbon and the hydrogen together to make their living tissue. You know, most plants is, is, is formed of carbohydrates, is, is you know, uh, uh, more or less our bodies too, because we just eat plants, you know, to, to make our own bodies. So we're all made of the same stuff, really. They're basically bonded to carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, so forth. But when the plants photosynthesize, they take carbon out, out, off the, out of the atmosphere and uh, release oxygen. So this um, snowball earth, it is theorized, um, happened because there were so many plants that had come, to, uh, come into existence on the earth. You know, plants had, uh, uh, you know, started colonizing the land, not just um, living in the sea, but they, they advanced onto the land. And they took so much carbon dioxide out of the, out of the atmosphere that they caused an ice age, a very severe one. Uh, that's uh, kind of, um, you know, uh, agree that carbon dioxide being a greenhouse gas, and the less there is in the atmosphere, you know, all things being equal, the cooler it gets. And at that time it got so cold that, you know, maybe just as a band of, of blue around the tropics, or even the earth did look indeed like a total snowball as that uh, picture imagines it. So that was what, 700 million years ago. So 
not so near the beginning of the earth, you know, but this is when, when plants are coming, uh, you know, to be uh, proliferating and uh, uh, kind of um, taking, uh, the, the sort of learning how to live on land. And so that's what's happened. So um, I just, just to showing these pictures to give this, you know, real sense of the variability of the earth's climate, the, the variability of, of the earth's uh, transformations uh, in all this time. Uh, since four, four and a half billion years ago. And, um, you know, those, those things aren't all called by, caused by life. Well, not all those changes and ice ages and, and, and kind of, you know, heating periods, are, they're not all caused by uh, the presence of life on Earth, but many of them are, or they're, they're, if they're not caused by uh, the presence of life, they're exaggerated by presence of life. Or, you know, once um, things go to an extreme of heat or cold, they're brought back to um, a kind of a more you know, sort of average temperature by the presence of life. So the presence of life has played a great role in, in, in you know, the climate of, of the earth, just as we're doing now, you know, in, in completely the wrong way. Uh, that's nothing new about that at all. And if you read uh, James Lovelock, you know, the, the Ages of Guy, you get, a, you get a very good picture of this and, uh, you know, very sensitive picture, very good one. So um, that's just, uh, there's, there's the point I'm trying to push from early on, you know, and uh, it's interesting to note that from, you know, the beginning of, of the Earth, uh, you know, four and a half billion years ago until the present, the solar radiation from the sun has increased by 32%. So that's the amount of heat, you know, and light hitting uh, the Earth from the sun uh, in the last, um, you know, over that uh, billions of years has increased by 32%. And that is because um, the, the sun is like a nuclear reactor. It's a nuclear fission reactor. And uh, the process of, uh, you know, consumption of his own fuel that's happening there um, leads to an increase, a natural increase in, in the amount of heat output of that kind of, you know, um, whatever nuclear reaction that's going on. So it's, uh, it's kind of, you know, um, quite an increase there, but the earth hasn't got hotter. The earth hasn't got so much hotter. You know, the earth has stayed within this, this band of cooling and, and heating, but all the time it stayed within a band which is more or less, you know, suitable for certain forms of life. So it's kind of, um, uh, you know, it's, it's like life has kept earth habitable for itself, um, you know, even though, you know, outside conditions have changed uh, quite uh, considerably, like the earth getting, you know, like the sun getting 32% uh, hotter. So that's, that's very interesting to see how, you know, uh, the presence of life sort of stabilizes and affects um, uh, 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 the, you know, the, 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 the climate of the earth, often for its own benefit. Next slide, please, Jace. Yeah, so here's just some, some quick um, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, snapshots of, of those changes. So that is, uh, that is Britain, that's Thames Valley, you people from uh, listening in London, from the Jamyang Buddhist Center. You're in the Thames Valley. So that's how it was supposed to have looked 125,000 years ago, hippos and, uh, uh, and elephants and, and, and a tropical climate. Yeah, so that's, um, you know, generally speaking, the, the era uh, of uh, geology that we're talking about there um, is an area of uh, repeated glaciation. Uh, repeated sort of you know ice descending and, and ice age conditions for the northern you know northern latitudes but uh, in between these glaciations you had quite um, quite quite strong reverses and you had periods shorter periods probably of, of interesting uh, you know where it got hot enough for it to be like a you know tropical climate certainly hotter than a Mediterranean climate in London next slide please yeah, so this is to show you the opposite. Now, this is um, Britain 27,000 years ago, the Brit ice uh, chronology. So we're here, we've got ice um, 1,000 meters thick over, you know, whatever, the central Scotland there. This is a big tongue of ice coming down from Scandinavia, uh, you know, and, and completely like uh, covering half of Britain. Uh, next slide, please, Jason. So you can imagine if you were driving up the M1 north of Leeds, suddenly you'd come into a landscape like this. Ice, you know, 800 meters thick across the M1. <laughs> so, 
uh, that's just to give you an idea, that's probably Antarctica or somewhere, but you know, that's, that's how Britain would have looked. You know, and then Britain's coastline would have been far different. If you remember that last slide, you know, that Britain was completely joined to, to, the, to, to, to Northern Europe. There was no, it wasn't an island. It was completely joined to, to Ireland. And it stuck out quite a long way into the Atlantic because so much ice was, so much water was locked up in ice that uh, the, coast, uh, the coastline of, of uh, you know, most of the world was, was much lower than it is now. So Britain certainly wasn't an island and all, all these sort of, you know, intrepid early men or early uh, humans or the early uh, hominids, human type beings who were venturing north, you know, you could cross, there was no English channel you had to cross, you could walk across from northern France because so much of the, uh, of the um, water of the world was locked up in ice. Uh, next slide, please, Jace. So that's just um, a temperature reading to show, just to give an idea of the fluctuations uh, of temperature. The blue line is Antarctica, and the red line is um, Greenland. So these, these are, they, they can read the temperature uh, of the um, era or of the, of the um, time by looking at the ice that formed at that time. They drill the ice out of the, um, uh, out of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the ice sheet covering Greenland. And some of these ice cores are very long because, you know, there's, there's you know, tremendous, tremendous thousands of feet of ice there. And they can get back to, uh, you know, um, whatever, 50,000 years ago. I don't know how far they can go back. What it says, yeah, Greenland ice core temperature records, 50,000 years. So they can get 50,000 years of ice in a reading. Uh, uh, more than that, you know, so these fluctuations, you see how the, the, the Earth's temperature is fluctuating. You know, so, so our, 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 our time now when, when the temperature of the Earth is suddenly all, you know, uh, kind of getting completely out of, uh, out of sort of normal zone or something. Well, there's nothing unusual about that at all over, hist you know, over geological time. Uh, these things are, these, it's always been unsteady. It's always been fluctuating. It's always been a kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, just a balance of forces which, which keep going out of a balance, getting to a different balance, smooth out in some direction, and then some other force comes along and, and makes the, uh, the temperature fluctuate in another way. And if you see where it says Younger Dryas, there's that, there's that column of gray there. There's a, col a vertical column of gray, and at the bottom it says Younger Dryas. Well, that was um, the last dip, you know, the dip means it's getting colder, yeah? You can see it shooting up on the left-hand side of that, that, that gray column, really quite high the temperature, then suddenly it drops deeply down into, a, into an ice age. So, you know, you've got a general trend of warming since about, you know, 30,000 years ago, a general, you know, general unsteady climb towards a peak. Uh, so it's getting really quite warm. You know, there's like the end of an ice age is going on, but then suddenly it drops really back down into, into cold conditions. The ice returns to Britain, you know, and all the, all the sort of these proto-humans and, and people are starting to migrate to, to Britain to find, you know, uh, game to hunt, you know, following the game as it moves back up into Britain as the temperate, temperate climate warms, you know, and suddenly they're all migrating back down to France again because it's getting so cold. So, and that's a very precipitate drop. Now, why is it happening? Well, there are theories. So even though we're having shooting high temperatures now, uh, you know, in our uh, present, you know, 2021 AD, you know, there's still possibilities of these, these sudden savage drops of temperature, you know, which, which happened, you know, in, in a very short length of time. Um, so there are theories about why that's happening, but we won't go that into that now. And then you see in, in the, the, the top there, you've got a Holocene, you've got the, the stable climate that, that um, we've all been used to. You know, for the last 10,000 years, the climate has been, you know, quite warmer. Uh, the ice age is, is, is sort of interrupted. And you've got this very steady uh, period of climate called the Holocene, which is, you know, all that civilization on earth, uh, human civilization has ever known. Yes, there were plenty of humans around before that, and they were, they were living through these ups and downs of, you know, these glaciations while they were evol evolving Africa. But since, you know, we can take the, the era of, you know, 10,000 years ago, sort of civilization area, then, then the, the climate has been stable. Although, as we learned, that, that period of stability seems now to be uh, coming to a uh, rather an abrupt end. Okay, next slide, please, Jace. 
So um, Britain uh, uh, is occupied by, you know, the first British humans. He were, I wouldn't say he's the first, you know, he's like um, uh, nowhere near the first. And the, he's, a hu he's, he's, he's Homo sapiens, but uh, before him, there were Homo erectus, you know, Homo, Homo habilis, Neanderthal, other human type races that evolved before uh, Homo sapiens coming into Britain. And when the ice got too thick, they retreated, you know. So he, he wasn't like, like the first uh, arrival. But Britons, when, when did he, human beings get to Britain? Well, I don't know. I mean, people say uh, maybe 40,000 years ago, but then they had to retreat because of the ice. So steady, you know, continuous occupation begins about 10, 12,000 years ago after that younger Dryas, you know, when the ice finally clears away and doesn't come back again by the time you get this Holocene stable climate, then Britain becomes continually occupied by Homo sapiens, funky monkeys. And they look like him. He's a real British gentleman, you know. So all these people, so Britain's for white people, you know, we don't have any darkies, any black people in our country. Well, you're all descended from black people. We're all mixed race, you know. What do you think the color would be of the people who, who, who migrated out of Africa? They're black, yeah. And so they've looked at the, the genes of somebody whose uh, you know, skeleton has been unearthed as a fossil. You know, somehow they can read the genes and say, well, it's quite possible that he did, he did have a black skin, black skin and blue eyes. So he's your first proper English gent, you know, black guy, which is, you know, food for thought for these uh, people who, you know, have uh, uh, got different ideas about their own, uh, you know, racial superiority or something. We're all descended from those guys. So what do you think about that? Next slide, please. So what, were, what did people do in Britain? These early, early guys, well, this is 2000 to 3000 years BC. This is uh, on, the, on the Western Isles of, uh, of, of Scotland, also known as the Outer Hebrides. This very beautiful stone circle. Most people will be familiar with Stonehenge, which is a very muscular, you know, a very masculine type of you know, very lumps of squared stone, kind of, you know, really massive and look like, you know, kind of put there by he-men. But this one, although it's about contemporary, is very, very different. It's, the, the stone is sculpted in these beautiful curves, you know. Uh, it's a natural grain of the rock. I'm not saying that it was deliberately made to be super curved or sculpted to be beautiful, but beautiful curves, you know, like the curves of a woman's back or something, like really following the grain of the rock and split open into these very slender, kind of, you know, um, slices of rock. It's, it's a very different feel from, from uh, uh, Stonehenge and, 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 and very feminine. It's very beautifully kind of uh, uh, slender and elegant and, and kind of, uh, you know, a kind of different energy. And that's, um, I really like that place when I went there. I found it a good place to meditate. Anyway, so these are, these are people um, uh, coming to, to live in Britain and uh, no, that's the end of the Stone Age, entering into the Bronze Age. So that's two, three thousand years ago, and we've got some monuments of what they were like. But next slide, please, Jason. This, the oldest tree in London, Totteridge Yew, two thousand years old. You know, so this tree was around uh, at the time of you know whatever it is. Bronze Age or something. No, it certainly, it can be claimed it was there at the time of Christ being born in the Holy Land. And maybe that tree was a little tiny sapling and a little, little young baby tree when the Romans arrived in 45 AD or whenever, whenever they, they founded London, isn't it? The, the Romans. Well, this tree was already there when the Romans were like, you know, digging in and, 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 and building their ramparts to keep the barbarians out. You know, civilization has arrived in Britain. Ha, ha, ha. You know, that tree was already there, the Totteridge Yew. Have you ever seen it? It's, um, you know, North London, right in the edge of London, but it's, 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 it's part of London now. Okay, so that's very impressive. We don't need to look at stone monuments. We look at living things that are that old. Next slide, please, Jason. Now, this is the a, a Yew in Wales, which is claimed to be 4,000 years old. On that, if you, the first uh, stone that's nearest the, the camera is not a gravestone. That's actually a, you know, a carving uh, to inform the tourists about this tree. And it does claim on that stone, it's written in stone, that that tree is 
you know, it has been carbon dated at 4,000 years old. It might be hard to believe, but it's the yew tree. They, they are extremely long lived. And you can see the trunk, you know, the, the, the center of a yew tree rots out in, in the British climate. You know, it's a bit, bit wet. So the tree grows strongly from the rim, but the, the inner uh, kind of uh, uh, core of the tree uh, it rots away. So you can't count the rings, but they have trees in, in places like Turkey where the, uh, um, the climate is rather different, it's, it's drier. And you know, those trees don't rot away in the middle and they, they can drill a, a, a core you know, right through the tree, uh, right into the middle of the tree and extract a piece of wood. You know, uh, and they can definitely count the rings and say these trees do live to 4,000 4, years old. So why not this one? Uh, you know, that, so that takes you back to the Bronze Age. It takes you back to the late Stone Age even. I don't know how, when, when the Stone Age finishes and the Bronze Age starts. I'm only guessing, right? But you know, it's like, um, again, you know, sort of a, a window into our past, you know? So like climate change isn't just something which is, you know, just coming along uh, in the late 20th century or, and, and the beginning of the 21st to surprise everybody, you know? Um, there's been plenty enough going on before that, which uh, gives you all the signs to, to put what's happening now into context. Next slide, please, Jason. So we're going back uh, now to the history of the earth. That was a bit about Britain, right? You know, just how we find yourself in Britain. But if you look at the history of the earth as a whole, you know, and go back a bit, go back a bit further. So that's 425 million years ago. So that's where the continents were. That's where, you know, that's what the map of the world looked like. 425 million years ago. So it's not just the weather that's changed, but you know, all the continents have changed positions. And that would also lead to weather changes, of course, you know, because con uh, mountain ranges affect the weather, ocean currents affect the weather. Of course they do. And so um, the fact that all the continents are in different place itself would mean that the climate would be rather different overall. Next slide, please, Jess. So here's, um, here's something, you know, only, only 195 million years ago. So that's a bit more recognizable, you know, thinking about the modern world, isn't it? Uh, you can see how Africa is still joined to South America, Antarctica is joined to Africa, Australia is joined to Antarctica, India is joined to Antarctica still. But good old Britain in the purple circle, it's moving up to its right place. Just off the edge of Europe. Oh, we don't want to be joining Europe with those nasty European Union types, let's just stay out a bit a bit. We want to be Brexit, so we're just this little island off, off the coast of Europe. Next slide, please, Jason. And this one is 250 million years into the future, you know, so the concerts are still sliding around. And that itself is uh, important in, in uh, climate change. You know, the Earth is very, like, still hot inside. You know, we have lots of volcanic activity, that tremendous uh, effect on the climate when it's, um, you know, vigorous and prolonged. And mountain ranges form and, 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 and land that is on the earth, uh, on the earth's surface gets dragged down uh, beneath another continent. One continent comes, collides with another continent, and one continent rides over another. So old rock that's been on the surface of the earth for a long time gets, gets uh, drawn under the earth, you know, a new rock comes up. And that very much affects the climate. Because, you know, some kinds of rock are very good at absorbing carbon dioxide, taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and then, then it becomes, uh, you know, the, the climate cools and so forth, you know. And then this rock gets taken under the earth, so the carbon gets buried uh, and taken out of the atmosphere for a while. So, so then, you know, cooling takes place because this balance of carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere is also very important. It's, it's uh, you know, crucial then, you know, the greenhouse gases determine what the climate's going to be like. Anyway, that's um, an interesting glimpse uh, or a projection into the future. Next slide, please, Jason. Earliest forms of, of life. They look like stones. They look like fossils, but they're living, apparently. Very ancient forms of life, very, very ancient. But still you can find uh, traces of them today in their living state. They're microorganisms like a cyanobacteria, so they're like algae, blue-green blue, blue -green algae but they capture a lot of uh, um, uh, grit, you know, a lot of sand, a lot of bits of, of stone in the, in the mats of, uh, of algae. The algae have uh, uh, sort of, you know, grow together in mats and they, they trap these uh, 
uh, kind of uh, debris of stone and bits of, of, of gravel and so forth in the mat of living material and gradually they build them into these uh, weird shapes that just look like lumps of, uh, you know, concrete or something. But um, apparently they're made by living creatures of a very, very primitive type. Uh, but even though they're so primitive, still, you know, they find them living today in just odd places. Uh, so ancient survivals, you know. Okay, Jason, next slide, please. So we're into the age of the dinosaurs. Next slide, please, Jason. So he's a very fine specimen. Yeah. Next slide, please. 50 million years ago. So a nice turkey like that would provide a good uh, Christmas dinner for a few families. So just the, the amazing kind of, um, you know, variety of life that, that Earth has thrown up, you know, in all these different uh, eras of different climate, different vegetation, and, uh, you know, millions of years in which things can happen, uh, evolve. Okay, Jason, next one, please. So here we've got the asteroid hitting the Earth. The asteroid that did for the dinosaurs. Yeah, some, some really huge asteroid, what, leaving a crater about 200 kilometers across. And the dinosaurs can't handle it, you know. The drastic effect, all the debris thrown into the atmosphere. Winter. Or I don't know how many months or whatever. So, you know, life on, 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 on Earth takes a great hit, a massive extinction. Uh, at the time of a, a, a dino, a, a, an asteroid impact that severe. So there's one asteroid a, a, a impact that does for the dinosaurs. Next slide, please, Jason. So here's a quick, um, quick view of those uh, um, kind of um, extinctions. All the red lines on the left, uh, if you look on the left side, on the left column, it says the in extinction intensity so the red lines are these great extinctions. So um, you, uh, where you see the yellow blob in the, in the middle column, that is um, indicating that the extinction was caused by asteroid impact. So there's two that you can see have got really big asteroids um, kind of, you know, opposite the red lines. So that's where you got um, super uh, devastation caused by huge asteroid or asteroids hitting the earth. But other, other red lines uh, are also quite long, but they, they, are not, they are not caused by asteroids. They're caused by maybe, uh, I think the first one was caused by a big freeze, the one down at the bottom. The one in the middle, which is the biggest of all, was caused by a um, great amount of uh, carbon dioxide getting in the atmosphere. There was great um, volcanic activity in Siberia. And this set off, um, set burning these huge coal seams that were left over from the Carboniferous area. So the, the Carbonifer Carboniferous era laid down huge quantities of coal and the volcanic activity started um, huge coal seams burning, which didn't stop burning for a very long time. So loads of carbon dioxide gets into the atmosphere and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's fatal for so many creatures because the, you know, the climate just gets so hot which of course is what's happening now. Okay, next slide please. Yes. So the first mammal, yeah? So that's um, coming out of the, the destruction of the dinosaurs, uh, the extinction of the dinosaurs, that's when mammals get, get, gets their chance. That's when we get our chance, basically. And the dinosaurs, you know, all um, kind of uh, go to destruction then, you know, our mammals can become, you know, a little bit braver. They can come out during the daytime and start having more fun and start breeding and, uh, you know, um, evolving into many different forms. So that was a very early type of mammal. Next slide, please, Jason. Yeah, so here's a much later type of mammal, but still two million years ago. So, uh, you know, the apes and the humans are splitting off into, you know, the, what will become the humans, the, the, the great apes we still know today, and the human's common ancestor, but they're, but they're split now. So the, the humans are free to evolve a bit more, you know, away from being like the great apes 
they, you know, and, and evolve their own special characteristics, hairlessness or less hair, let's say, bigger brains, smaller stomachs and so forth. Next slide, please, Jace. Yes. It's another female figure. So that's a um, female figure, the Venus of Willendorf. So 30,000 BC, this is found in Germany. So uh, creatures living in Germany at that time made that 30,000 years ago, human type creatures. Next slide, please, Jason. So male figures, Homo erectus. So he's, um, as it says, the first ho um, Homo species, you know, a human type person, not Homo sapiens, but you know, first, you know, Homo species to populate the old world. You know, so that means they're moving out of Africa. That's what I mean by populate the old world, moving out of Africa. And they also live for a very long time, two million years. So the, the present human Homo sapiens, we've only lived for about 300,000 years. So he, he holds a record, although he's now extinct, of course, for, for living the longest. Homo erectus, walking uh, upright on two feet. Jason, next one. Neanderthal, yeah. So they also moved out of Africa separate from, from the Homo sapiens and before Homo sapiens, probably. But they couldn't hold it together, yeah. Hunter-gatherers, small populations, uh, you know, scattered. They never achieved population density, you know, and eventually in, interbred with humans sometimes, uh, interbred with Homo sapiens but eventually going extinct. So goodbye Neanderthal. Next slide please, Jace. But Neanderthal gets it, by, but Homo sapiens is getting it together, you see? Domestication of animals, domestication of, uh, of crops. So it's all going right for Homo sapiens, or is it, you know? Domestication of the horse, 3000 BC, 500 BC, Kazakhstan. Next slide please, Jace. And then, horses aren't good enough. We want our own stronger power than that. So we have to invent the steam engine. Thomas New Common, 1712. Very primitive kind of steam engine, but it's very effective. You know, people bought a lot of these steam engines. So the steam heats up in the cylinder. You know, so the cylinder is pushed up by, by the steam. So then the, uh, the, the, on the other side of the beam, you know, that, that, that long rod goes down into the mine. And then when, they, when it's gone up like that, then cold water goes into the cylinder, it's sprayed into the cylinder, the cylinder cools down. So the cylinder comes back down as sort of the vacuum of the cold water and that rod on the left hand then goes up. You know, it's a beam engine going up and down, tilting like that, and that's pumping water out of the mine. That's what a lot of his, his steam engines were used for, pumping water out of mines. And, and very much cheaper and better than, than having loads of horses doing it for sure. Even though it's a very primitive machine, it sold very well. And he, it was uh, the first successful kind of, you know, sold steam engine to be sold. Next slide, please. And here we have, you know, the steam engine reached sort of the, the limits of its prowess, let's say, you know, the steam locomotives that were being built, you know, about just after the Second World War. You know, they're beautiful uh, engines for people who like that kind of thing. You know, the steam engine reaches its peak of, uh, of power and, 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 and kind of efficiency. Uh, and this one was built, I think, in East Germany, Dresden or somewhere. You know, so I'm just saying this is the industrial revolution taking off. What are these things burning? They're burning fossil fuel. Right. So it's right from 1712, Thomas New Commons, you know, production of, um, you know, the first steam engine that, that um, uh, you know, the use of fossil fuel takes off, you know, goes off astronomically, goes off the scale. And of course, after that, we have oil, we have uh, gas, and of course, we also have nuclear power. But the, the danger to our climate is coming from burning fossil fuels, you know. So that's um, uh, kind of a, just, I'm not going to show you any more pictures of, of uh, combustion engines like burning oil, oil and, uh, and gas and so on. That's not necessary. Next slide, please, Jace. So there we are, that's the end of this section. Hey, well, we even get to send uh, our spaceships out into space. And this is the one that's got the furthest from Earth, the Voyager, it left the solar system. And from four billion miles away, it took that photograph. So let's get the Earth into perspective, yeah? From the pale blue dot. Is that all we're worth, you know, from four billion miles away? That's what it looks like. Uh, 
Okay, so um, that's a, just a little, you know, kind of a, an excursion into the history of the planet, the history of life on the planet, and the history of um, our particular, uh, you know, species. So it helps us to get into a spe perspective, the, you know, the disaster that's, um, that's hitting uh, the world now from human interference, putting so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Okay, Jace, we can, we can turn off that for a bit. Thank you. Yeah, so that's all about, um, you know, climate disaster. So what about the Buddhist bit? Yeah, so um, that's where we're coming to. Um, but, you know, we have to know what, we, what we're dealing with, don't we? So this is the era of, of a breakdown. This is the era of, 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 you know, saying goodbye to civilization as we know it and saying goodbye to the biosphere, really. I hope we don't lose the whole planet. So James Lovelock, who, who you may know as um, the author of the, the Ages of Gaia, he's now 101 years old. And in, in a recent, uh, you know, ex extremely old, but very lucid, uh, in a recent interview in The Guardian, he says, yes, me and the biosphere, we're now in the, one, in the last 1% of our lives. Yeah, he's, he's 101 years old, so it feels like he's got about one year left to live. Although he's still very, looks very healthy. So, you know, that's, he says, that's, that's the same with the biosphere. And he, he's written the best interpretations of, of, you know, the interactions between life and the planet that, that, that have been, you know, put together, I think. You know, he's a very, very imaginative uh, uh, person, but very much a scientist. So, you know, he's, he's a person whose views are, I have to respect uh, very much. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's, um, it's um, I'm not sort of trying to dwell on the, on the, on the, um, uh, the adversity side of things. I'm not trying to dwell on, uh, you know, the problems that lie ahead type of thing. But of course, as Buddhists, we know, you know, samsara is, is the very dismal place to be. You know, it's a very, uh, you know, it's a place you don't want to put your trust in, let's say. Don't put your trust in samsara. So that's, um, that's always, you know, always the case. Buddha's, Buddha's message was, has always been founded on, you know, impermanence. And, and the kind of you know the transience of samsara so now i think it's just a question of you know um, we having to go through adversity and come out the other side so we've had all this um, you know time to practice the dharma and uh, you know get deeply into it and, and use all the uh, the compass of civilization for a serious pursuit and we must have to uh, face the fact that that isn't necessarily going to be the case in life to come now you know that the, uh, the catastrophe hitting the earth is going to be so serious that, you know, even somebody's sincere Dharma practice uh, and chance to learn about the Dharma is going to be heavily interrupted. So never mind people who are just looking for, you know, the, the, the way to get by in this life, you know, for us Dharma practitioners, how do we have to think about it? Yeah, so, um, but that's, as I say, I don't really want to dwell upon the, um, the adversity side, except we just have to go through it as bodhisattvas. We don't leave samsara behind. We're not trying to just get out of samsara for our own sake. That's not the point. We want to get to Buddhahood. Buddhahood re requires remaining in samsara for as long as necessary. Seeing the faults of samsara, not being, you know, like, um, uh, uh, not being uh, misled by samsara, but working here for... Uh, you know, as long as it takes for us to collect our collective merit so that we can become Buddhas. And we collect our collection of merits by working for sentient beings. So, um, you know, we just have to go through the, uh, whatever uh, the future brings for us now. Um, you know, that will be horrible weather, you know, political instability and hunger and so forth. But all the time we have to think now, no, no violence, no aggression if at all possible, you know, follow the rules of karma. All sentient beings are just like me, you know, even those, you know, ragged, filthy refugees that will be coming up in, in greater and greater numbers from the southern latitudes where life is just unlivable anymore. You know, whether they're carrying guns or not carrying guns, you know, we still have to have compassion, even if we have to run away from them, uh, you know, because they're carrying guns and that. so still we have to have our compassion. So, you know, the Dharma challenge is always there. And our human ability to cooperate is always there, you know. In times of adversity, you do find greater cooperation between people, you know, as in the Second World War, so we're told, you know. 
that, that uh, you know, people got it together and helped each other in those, uh, you know, uh, critical times. Yeah, so, um, so then, you know, like, even if we have got the, um, the, uh, the, the, the karma to have a precious human rebirth, even if we've got good karma, like, you know, we've, uh, we've done our good deeds. So, you know, we, we've got a, a deed, the ripening effect of which would be, you know, a precious human rebirth. But if there are no precious re re human rebirths to be had, what are we going to do? Bottleneck, a bottleneck, yeah? There's plenty of people who've got the, uh, the karma to have a good precious human rebirth, but there aren't enough precious human rebirths to go around. Like, especially like going, like all the, all the contents of the bottle are trying to get through the neck of the bottle. So, you know, you can imagine these, um, these beings, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, it's a womb neck, shall we say. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a, a an egg being fertilized. So all these, um, uh, all these consciences are trying to jump into that fertilized egg and to get, be there first, to get their precious human reaper. <laughs> trying to push each other out of the way so they can jump in and get to be the one <laughs> that, 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 that grabs that egg that's just been fertilized. But the human population has shrunk so much, you see, that, that uh, it's going to be like that. So what's going to happen? Well, you know, if there is um, a complete breakdown of the biosphere, and, and, and this could all end in nuclear war even, you know, you shouldn't forget that. You know, as, as, as civilization comes to, you know, um, great discord and conflict, you know, there's, there's more people fighting over fewer resources. Then it could even be a nuclear war. There could even be like a, a total disaster like that. So as beings, you know, we, we've made, we put, we've laid down whatever imprints we can, you know, we really strove to be to get to to put down the the, the imprints to become a uh, uh, yeah, bodhisattva. Yeah, we really want to do that. So we've made many pure prayers, many pure aspirations. You know, at, at whatever level we could. So we've tried. So we haven't got good imprints. Maybe you know, we're not kidding ourselves. So don't 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 be um, afraid that, that they're all wasted. They're never wasted. So even if you have to take birth ten million years in the mud at the bottom of the, of the ocean, you know, as a worm or something, because that's the only kind of life that's surviving, uh, you know, in the, in the kind of, you know, great transformations of, of heat and, you know, global warming that's going on on the surface. You know, the, the, only, the only kind of um, uh, lives that are left to take on this earth are, you know, deep at the bottom, in the mud at the bottom of the ocean and, and, in, and the sort of very extreme sort of niches like that. Well, don't be afraid. That's it. That we've got to go through that. I'm only making this up. I don't know how long it's going to take the Earth to be to come back to normality after a, 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 a kind of a, a mass extinction. But in the past, people have said, you know, it takes 10 million years maybe for, for the Earth to get back to a state of, you know, stability and, and kind of more reasonable climate after a, a, a mass extinction. 10 million years. So you, you're born for 10 million years as a, as a worm at the bottom of the ocean. What about that? But then, you know, but then, you know, there's, there's the opportunity. Then, you know, the, the, the time comes around again. You know, just um, uh, like, uh, what shall we say, you know? Well, when, when people are leaving Africa, you know, 20,000 years ago, 30,000 years ago, People are migrating after Af out of Africa. The climate's improving, uh, so the people are tempted to leave Africa and go further north, you know, to explore and, and, and find new territories. And then, you know, the, there's people who go and they, they, they strive and they get all the way to, uh, you know, the Ganges, the Ganges River Basin. By the time they get there, people have, have learned how to, um, you know, domesticate rice so that they can, they can plant rice and, uh, in, in the muddy, on, on the muddy banks of the Ganges, this huge floodplain, this huge muddy kind of floodplain of, of, of the Ganges is astonishingly wide and massive in places, you know, so supports quite a population of people and, and ideal for growing rice, probably, you know, I'm not an expert on these things. But, you know, you can see how people will migrate, migrate out of Africa and go, you know, generation after generation, getting nearer to India and eventually 
they would get to India, you know, and then they, they would, they would, you know, find a place by the banks of the Ganges and plant their rice. And it's at that point, you see, that Buddha decides, oh, there's something going on here. You know, he sees that pale blue dot four billion miles away down, you know, some distant part of the universe he's never thought about for a while. And there's a planet there, you know, and other people are getting it together. Maybe he did come, maybe the Buddha taught, taught Homo erectus, you know, maybe he taught the Neanderthals, maybe the Buddha came in, in whatever form he chose to try to lead those people to the light, you know, there's intelligent life after four billion years on this earth of striving, there's intelligent life appearing. So you, can, you might have gone amongst those Homo erectus and Homo habilis and Homo whatever this and Neanderthals and Dennis Ovens and met those people, you know, in whatever form he chose to take. But they hunt to gather a society like the very loose, you know, bands of people roaming over the earth uh, and, and kind of um, it, always a low population density. So he might have taught, maybe, maybe some of those did become Bodhisattva, some of those guys, some of those people. But, um, you know, they couldn't sustain it. They couldn't keep it together. What you need is a bit more of a substantial civilization, maybe, you know, for the, for the message to hit home on a global scale eventually. So when people have domesticated uh, cereals, you know, maybe just domesticated a few um, uh, kind of animals too, and they've got a, such a rich place as the Ganges, as the Ganges uh, you know, river valley to uh, uh, prosper in, you know, then there's a society that starts to create, create a surplus. So it isn't just people scraping a living and just, um, you know, surviving from hand to mouth. You know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a government they're paying taxes to, you know, and there's, there's an education sort of uh, possibilities and there's trade, you know, so it's like, this is the time the Buddha can appear. This is the time he can, he can come down and go to the villages and talk to the people. And, you know, it, it, it has a sort of, it gathers momentum, you know. Somebody, somebody, it's like, it's like, um, you know, it isn't just lost. The, the, those people's ears are tuned beautifully to the Buddha's message, but that's all there is to it, you know. It doesn't last from generation to generation. But when civilization is a bit more organized, you know, and there's, there's a, a definite kind of a feeling of sort of a bit more intelligence in the air, you know, then Buddha's message starts, takes hold, isn't it? You know, because that's what happened on, on, on that Ganges plane there. So that's, that's, you know, why the Buddha would come down and teach in that place. Because, you know, sort of civilization had, had kind of uh, organized itself a bit. But isn't it impressive? You know, how long did that take? It took, you know, four billion years. So that's, that's what I want to look, looking, one reason I'm looking back at that history, you see. You know, how long did it take for life on this earth to be ripened, you know, and, and kind of refined enough to be ready for a message of the Buddhist philosophy. Well, it took four and a half billion years. Half a billion years of just the planet settling down and cooling off, you know, and the, the, the liquid water gathering on the surface and, and kind of a, enough of a, a, some kind of atmosphere or other for some sort of, you know, very primitive creatures to come along. You know, and so life starts at about, you know, four million years ago, 4.1 million years ago, so they stay on the earth. And then from that point, 4.1 billion years ago to now, Magnificent transformations of, 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 of life, whether it's, uh, you know, plant life or, or it's a sentient being life, you know. But even so, it takes, you know, even though the, 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 the evolutionary possibilities, the changes of climate, the changes of, you know, continent and scenery, and, and all those sort of, you know, possibilities transforming and fluctuating together, it takes four billion years for a human being to come along who's intelligent enough to listen to Buddha's teachings and take the essence. So that's so impressive, yeah? We should, we should look back at that and be amazed. And then Buddha comes and teaches four billion years after the earth has, you know, life on the earth has got going and he delivers his message. And, you know, we've taken it up on it and, and We've tried to make sense of it, and some people have made brilliant sense of it, and they've gone on the Buddhist Bodhisattva path, and they won't turn back, you know, and they will become Buddhas themselves. So that, that's just, a, to me, that's, um, you know, 
something that comes out of studying the history and it makes you realize you know how precious this opportunity is we have how amazing it is so uh i just want to sort of um uh kind of um uh, put that on the table yeah and then you see where did i leave us i left us you know if in the modern age there's people who you know we want to study buddhism we want to carry on yeah but i'm saying conditions are going to be much more adverse we, we're coming you know we're crashing into the brick wall we're going off the cliff you know the steam uh, the, the 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 boat is, is just heading straight for the rocks and it's going to hit there with an almighty crash so as i said you know uh, precious human re rebirth might become very rare on this earth so what we're going to do then well i say we have to accept that you know the 10 million years of, of taking rebirth as a worm at the bottom of the ocean okay that's cool yeah what's so cool about it is 10 million years later again you know on some i don't know on some on the banks of some river you know after all the whole course of you know all that uh, loss of life and, and kind of loss of species, 90% of the species on the earth go extinct or something terrible like that. After all that rebuilding, you know, and, and coming back together and coming back to the, the flourishing of life, which is, you know, um, what it was like when we arrived, you know, our species arrived on this planet. Until now, this fantastic flourishing of the biosphere starts to, you know, it starts to look rich again. And there, by the banks of some, of some you know, river with a massive muddy floodplain you know and the streams coming down from the hills to you know to cross the floodplain to join uh, the, the the main river there you know and then there's people there again you know great river valley civilizations early civilizations on earth great river valley civilizations and then they find that this um, you know this wild rice or you know crop that's growing in the, in the swamps that they can you know use as their carbohydrate source then there's somebody gets the idea ah but why can't we you know instead of just going into the swamps and looking for it we'll start planting it on our own land you know and we'll bring the stream the water of the streams to our land yeah we'll start irrigating you know and, and with domestication of cereals yeah domestication of cereals it'll happen again 10 million years in the future this is how i envisage it you see and then people will be there again, you know, the, the, the man will be there with his wife, he's be sitting, you know, uh, outside his hut, you know, his wife is cooking the dinner, cooking the lunch, you know, in, in the compound outside the hut, on the open fire, and a visitor comes to their compound, and it's a guy, and he's dressed in, you know, dressed in rags, really, he's dressed in a sort of a cloak of rags, and he's holding the black begging bowl, you know, the, the symbol of the spiritual, the spiritual seeker. Ten million years in the future, I'm talking about. So then this guy, you know, he, he goes to his front gate where, of, of, the, of his compound to meet this guy. And he looks the guy in the eye, you know, and his hands come together in the gesture of greeting, you know, where you greet a, a spiritual superior. And he says, I've seen you somewhere else before. And the, this spiritual seeker, you know, he gives him a big smile and looks deep into his eyes. You know, and then as he's looking into this, the eyes of the, of the householder, you know, for a long minute, he's obviously searching back into the recesses of his own mind, you know, of his own memory. And he says, ah, oh, yes, it was in another lifetime, full of toil and blood. And you can imagine, you know, in the next day, when this wife, when he tells his wife what happened, his wife looks up at this man's face. She's also, you know, feels that, um, somebody they've been waiting for for a long time has finally come to visit them and so the next day you know in front of this guy both of them on their knees they they renew their bodhisattva vows there's been a 10 million year gap but so what you know the imprints they laid down have ripened up truly and there they are 
on their knees again, taking the Bodhisattva vows. So it's not over yet. The story of you know humans encounter with you know the wisdom of the, of the universe, the wisdom of the Buddhas, and how to get there, how to leave samsara behind, but but not abandon samsara. You know, learn enough so that you will be the one who can be, you know, the teacher, the one who can be uh, the Buddha. You get there. So never never lose faith in that. Whatever the hardships, whatever the disasters. So this is from the, um, the Exalted Sublime Golden Light Sutra. I prostrate to the Buddhas, oceans of virtue, golden light Mount Sameru. Going for refuge, I bow my head in prostration to the golden conquerors. Their compassionate light dispels the double mantle of darkness. Buddhas are suns, blazing glory, splendor and renown, golden in color, eyes fine as pure, faultless lapis, they glow with the glitter of pure gold. Their exquisite and beautiful limbs are utterly flawless and perfectly formed. From pristine limbs, the Buddha's sun radiates shafts of golden light. Consumed by the flame of negative passion, sentient beings blaze like fire. They are refreshed and soothed by the moon-like light of the Buddha's. 32 major marks render their senses exquisitely refined. Their awe-inspiring limbs are graced by 80 minor signs, filled with merit and glory, like splendid rays of spinning light. They orbit, as does the sun, in the darkness of the triple realms. May sentient beings evolve into such Buddhas, graced with virtue, color, fame and renown, their bodies embellished with major marks of goodness and the sublime 80 minor signs. Through these virtuous actions, I shall soon become a Buddha on this earth, preaching the doctrine that guides the world. I shall free beings for long afflicted by suffering. I shall triumph over Mara with his army and might. I shall turn the wheel of virtuous Dharma, abiding for inconceivable eons. I shall satisfy sentient beings with the water of Dharma's nectar. Just as the conquerors of the past have completed six perfections, these perfections I too shall fully achieve. My ignorance, hatred and desire pacified, I shall conquer delusion and dispel pain. I shall always remember my former births, hundreds of existences and ten millions of lives. Always recalling the vanquishing sages, I shall listen to their teachings in full. So um, let's be amazed that for billion years of history, the four billion years it took us to get here, and uh, you know, make use of our time, long or short. Anybody got any questions? Okay, you're all cool. I've got a question. Jason? Yeah. What, what, how do you factor in the whole other, other realm scenario when it comes to the planet? So, you know, if the Earth itself is coming to turmoil, what happens to these other realms that are dependent on it? And even are they dependent on it? You mean like, what, what realms are you thinking of? No, oh, some of these more ethereal ones, you know, you might say uh, the spirit realm or the god realms, or I don't know how, quite how it works. Yeah, well, I wouldn't have thought they're particularly dependent on the earth myself. Right. You know, earth is just um, kind of the way that the, the, the kind of the, uh, the place that animals and humans tune into. So I don't know, yeah, I, I was thinking about the earth. Yes, but we could, if you wanted to bring in the other realms of slacking existence, yeah, we'd have to. I guess to open up to a slightly different, uh, you know, a bit of a wider picture. 
So I haven't, I haven't really thought about that in preparing for this talk, but yes, um, that should be factored in at some point. Oh, there's someone with their hand up. Uh, Kate. Yeah. Hey. Hiya. Hello. Hi, I'll just lower my hand now. Hang on. Lower hand. Okay. Um, yeah, so I get I get how you've you've sort of given us um a, a really big picture so that so that we can not despair really. Because if we've made a bodhisattva vow, you know, as long as space endures, as long as sentient beings remain, so too will I remain to dispel the miseries of the world type of thing, yeah? Yeah. So that's, that's really good because, you know, we don't, we don't have to be fixated about this life and have a, we can have a vaster vision about it all and we can keep our bodhisattva vows, whatever, whatever is chucked at us. But given that there's going to be so much suffering... I mean, there already is so much suffering anyway, but given, given the extent of suffering that is going to manifest because of the current um, ecological and climate crisis, what would you say it's appropriate to do? Or is there not a simple answer to that? I mean, you're kind of, you're kind of saying, well, you know, just be patient because you'll, you'll uh, you, you know, things will change and you'll still, you, you can still carry on. But in the, in the face of so much suffering, what do you think is the appropriate response of Dharma practitioners in, you know, in, this, in this crisis? Or is there not, you know, is it everyone's got to decide for themselves? I just want, yeah, can you just speak to that a little bit? Yeah, well, I was trying to um, universalize it, yeah. Like in, the, in those verses at the beginning, like child of one womb, child of all mothering, yeah, child of one earth, child of the universe child of one culture, child of the immensity, child of one lifetime, child of eternity, child of the surface level, oh child, no child, oh child of no inherent being. Yeah, so don't just think of your happiness coming in uh, this life being all kind of hitting the rocks. Yeah, but what can we do? What can we do? Yeah, um, people have different responses. Um, it depends, uh, you know, on... Uh, what you think can be done. Um, so, and it's very hard to predict the future, of course, you know. Like things can take all sorts of turns, which even the best of clients, uh, clients climate scientists have never really kind of got their minds around because this, the system is so complex. So there could be relief, you know. It's not necessarily we just going straight to uh, extreme global, global warming in a straight line. There can be, you know, um, if we look at the, the climate records in the past, you know, we find these, these increases of heat are often, you know, followed by extreme drops of temperature, like in that, um, the Younger Dryas, the last, uh, spasm of the ice age I mentioned, that the climate was heating up quite rapidly, but then immediately it dropped into some, you know, a very cold zone. And they say that's something to do with, you know, cold water from, say, Greenland spreads out of the surface of, of, the, of the North Atlantic, cold water from melting water from, um, the uh, uh, Antarctic ice sheet spreads out over the, the sea surrounding Antarctica and, and uh, fresh water floats over salt water. So the fresh, the, the ice that melts is fresh water and its coldness, you know, cools the air, cools the climate down in, in, in those zones. And uh, that kind of a, a, a very strong cooling effect, they say. Uh, it might make the weather much more stormy, you know, it can change this, this Gulf Stream that we're all so used to in Britain. You know, so those uh, kind of uh, possible drops in temperature are also there, you know, they're temporary, but, uh, you know, it's not like, um, I know what's going to happen. It's impossible to, to be too, too confident in your predictions. Um, but all I can say is, um, you know, you have to hold to your Buddhist truths, don't you? And the Buddhist truth is always impermanence. So, you, you know, you have to be ready to relinquish anything. There's no use to be, no use being attached to, you know, to anything at all, you know, so you have to be able to give up anything, even if there's no global warming problem at all. You know, you're supposed to meditate on death every day. A death and impermanence, aren't you? 
as if you know I'm living my life. This is my last day anyway. But you're always supposed to live, always supposed to live like that with a constant mindfulness of impermanence. So that's one thing, isn't it? So then, and then along with that is the karma. How do you how do you improve the future? Stick to your good karma. When there's a crisis, um, there's more temptation maybe to um, uh, fall back on aggression and violence, you know, to save your portion of whatever it is that's getting, you know, hard to find, to, to defend your portion. You, you, you take up, a, you know, um, sort of a military means or something. So, you know, that's never the Buddhist way or only in very, very extreme circumstances or something. Yeah? So you've got to keep to your Buddhist principles. That's what I, I would say. And then the compassion. Yeah? Those, those people who want to, you know, take away what little bit we've got, you know, those, those people who are coming along, you know, the civilization breaks down, they're grabbing what they can because, you know, they, there's no kind of, you know, um, uh, law and order like they used to be. So that it's, things become a bit more, you know, um, it's sort of a, a law and order breaking down, then, then there's, there's much more power play going on a, 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 in your localities, isn't there? And it's maybe aggression and difficulty, but always you're trying to build trust between people. You're always trying to build, you know, the, the good relations between people. And that's, I think, you know, one of the secrets of, of, um, of the human being's success is our ability to cooperate. You know, it's not like we're all just ruthless and, and aggressive when we, we can take these Neanderthals and, you know, just slaughter them all and, and take their women or something and rape them and, you know, like, oh, because we're really so ruthful. We are, we are the successful species, you know. We did it to them and we'll do it to anybody else in order to, you know, accumulate the riches of Earth for ourselves. But I don't think that's the whole story of humanity. You know, humanity has got its ability to, you know, come out, um, you know, as, as a kind of... Um, successful species is very much also due to it's the, the human's ability to cooperate the human's ability to to work together and solve problems by dialogue and uh, you know um uh, uh sitting down and working it out you know instead of just resorting to throwing stones and, and bashing each other with sticks like chimpanzees might do or they're supposed to do you know they, they don't have a, a means to communicate um you know to try and solve the situation without just going to, you know, displays of aggression and, you know, who's the strongest guy around here? You better back off because I look stronger than you do. Displays of, you know, power and strength. Human beings have been able to negotiate. They've got the language, of course, you know. And they've got kids who have a long, long childhood, so they, there's a lot to learn. So the, the human brain is very, you know, adaptable to different situations. So, you know, that, that, that sort of compassion power and, and, and kind of, you know, cooperative power of, of human beings we should you know we should rely on that and have faith in it so that's you know in, impermanence and then there's compassion and of course the thing we haven't talked about tonight is the ultimate truth yeah. and in fact you know when you look at what buddha taught at the ultimate level there is no arising you know? there is no ceasing there is no sameness there is no difference there is no severance there is no permanence it's just um, a kind of a, these, these things are just, a, you know, conventional, kind of a part of con conventional kind of, you know, terminology. And if you look, you know, well, what's really there, what's really there, there's, you won't find anything really there. You won't find, you know, um, the Chinese army, you know, stomping all over uh, the east or you won't find the beautiful curve of a one's back you know or you won't find you know um the difference between you know fresh water and dirty water on the ultimate level all of those are just kind of you know um well you know they're just like um illusions and dreams the city of gandhava you know if we can get down to the ultimate level there's a great relief that we don't take what's happening in the conventional level so seriously as you know, um, in the way that, that we, we have to take it because we're just grasping at everything to, to inherently exist. So we can realize emptiness, then um, things will look a bit different. And, uh, you know, I'm sure we will understand the suffering of the world much better and know how to deal with it. So we must press on with our, you know, approach towards ultimate truth as much as possible as well. Okay, so um, I thought we could finish off with a mandala, you know, offering. I want to say, 
the amazement of um, looking back over those four and a half billion years of um, you know um, transformation and evolution on uh, this Earth's surface. Uh, you know, that's what came across to me when I started looking at these things. If people wanted me to talk about the climate, how was I going to do it? So I think, you know, along with that amazement should come a great gratitude. You know, so remembering the beautiful things we've seen, that's, that's um, kind of, you know, uh, one level. Now, so this isn't, we want to offer a mandala, but not the mandala in the usual sense. So we're going to use the same words. So I hope Jason's got the word ready in a minute. But a mandala in a, in a sense of, you know, a mandala made of the Earth's beauties. So we can, you, mandala is the, the universe, but, you know, retrospective, we can look down that four, 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 four billion years of, of, of Earth history and pick out the highlights, you know, and these are the beautiful things that were there that were part of the process of us becoming able to be here. So um, can we see, just see these last few sides, Jason? You know, so you build up your mandala as you want it, you know. But these are just a few things that people sent me as that they would like to have in the mandala. Are you there, Jason? Yeah, I'm going to share it now. <laughs> So you, you've got to think what you're going to put in your mandala now. So these are some other people's ideas. Of... Yeah, okay, go ahead, Jason, next one. So obviously that's a brilliant thing, the, the corals, you know, and the, the magic of the tropical oceans. They'll soon all be gone, they say. So, um, yeah. Uh, Definitely, we want to express our gratitude uh, for that, uh, you know, marvelous source of life and flourishing. Next slide, please, Jason. The Galapagos tortoise. Yeah, you know. He could be supporting the mandala, right? He'd be lift, holding it up on his back, or for him and three of his mates. You could have that right at the base, holding the mandala. Okay, Jason, next one. So that is New Zealand, I'm told. So, you know, um, beauties of the Southern Hemisphere. Next one, Jason. So what's that? Tropical rainforest or maybe temperate rainforest? And might, that might be New Zealand as well, I don't know. Next one, Jason. So we have so many dog lovers in the human race, yeah? So, um, He's quite a specimen. Next slide. And she's even more beautiful. Look at her. She's fantastic. Yeah, man's best friend. Somebody like that would help you get through lockdown, wouldn't they? Okay, Jason. So the forests, northern forests. Man has such an affinity with trees, doesn't he? Next one. And then summer, our beautiful northern um, green summers. Yeah, so that's all the pictures now. That's the last of them. That just gives you an idea, you see. I mean, if we had time, we could build up this mandala into, you know, I don't know how, I've never really thought it through how I want to do it. I always have uh, woolly mammoths in my mandala, but the, the giant tortoise will be fine, you know instead of the mammoth, supporting the whole thing. And then, you know, you can have all the sea creatures around the, uh, you know, around one section, can we just see creatures, you know, whales and octopuses and, and kind of corals. Anything you like, you know, the, what about those, those um, you know, plankton, the, the, those early creatures that started the, the whole game of photosynthesis of, which has been so significant. No oxygen, oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere unless you had the plants producing it. So we have to be grateful to the plants. So then the next level, you can have the creatures live on land, you know, I don't know, sort of the buffaloes and the, and the woolly mammoths or whatever it is, the snakes, whatever you... Uh, you know, the dogs, of course, horses, you know, 
And uh, so this is a staggering kind of variety of creatures that uh, you know, evolution has produced, all those uh, 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 kind of bizarre and huge you know, um, uh, kind of dinosaurs, obvious choice, but you know, there's so many others that are more modest, but equally, equally incredible. And then on the next level, all the creatures of the air, you know, all the creatures of the, of the, um, that live uh, or spend a lot of time in the air, the, those insects, the bees buzzing, and the bats, and the swifts. I read these, uh, they, they, they managed to um, put some sort of recorder on, on the back of a swift, and they said the, the, the swifts, they often, they keep flying, they never, they never touch land for 10 months at a time. They just fly, or they sleep in the air, they breed in the air, you know, they make, uh, they make love in the air. Obviously, they have to come down and lay their eggs in a nest. So, you know, for a couple of months, they come down and, and feed their babies. But, uh, but the rest of the 10 months of the year, they, they fly to Africa, but they never touch down to take a rest. If they want to drink, they just scoop down the water with their beaks as they, they go low over a, over a lake or something, over a pond and scoop some water with their beak. I believe, you know, but they never come down and take a rest and have a drink. So they just fly for 10 months continuously. And that's just a little bird, the swift. So you've got to be amazed. And gratitude, yeah. I think, you know, you know, samsara is, is a sort of, you know, a kind of a, a bit of a gross place, yeah. There's plenty of horror. But it's also a glory story, you see. It's like, um, you know, all those you know, horrible things that we see and the, the incredible cruelty of, of, of man, you know, that's, that's one of the worst things. But you know, that, that four, four and a half billion years of history, like, like you know, all the steps that had to be taken in order for there to be an intelligent being like us at the end, you know, at the, at the climax or something of that 4,000 years, of billion years, 4,000 million years of evolution, that it should come to us. You know, we are the, the, the kind of, uh, the, the end product of all that time. So we should have gratitude. We should visualize all that, you know, all that's gone on in those uh, 4,000, 4,500 billion years. You know, all those sort of asteroids hitting the earth and the moon breaking up from the sun and all the kind of crazy things that went on, the, the, the glaciations and the, and the hot zones and the tropics and everything. You know, we visualize all that and offer it up to the Buddha. And if we can do that, that'll be it. That'll be enough for tonight, yeah? We were there, you see. We were there. The echo of the Buddha's teachings still lasts with us. And it's a pure echo. We're getting a, an echo of the Buddha's teachings, but it's a pure echo. It's exactly what the Buddha taught, as far as we can see, you know? How would the Dalai Lama make a mistake? You know, he's got such superb teachers. And the teachings are also well recorded and so beautifully edited, you know? So we're a very pure echo of the Buddha's teachings now. But how long is it going to last for? This is it, you know, this is our chance. Climate, you know, the, the carbon is going up like that, the carbon's going off the scale. So this is our beautiful chance. We should have gratitude, you know, for, uh, you know, all that evolution that went into putting us together. So here's my mandala. Hey. <laughs> That's a proper mandala. Anyway, I can't hold that up and chant at the same time. So, have you got have you got the words of the mandala? It won't come across as a very good chant because uh, you know Zoom's not very good for chanting. But I'm going to chant it, and you can listen or something. Have you got the mandala up there? Have you found it? Yeah, everyone's got it in the chat box, or I can share the screen to show the letters too. Okay, so we read the, the capital letters, right? And it's the mandala uh, to Chenrezig, actually. So watch out for here, Chenrezig's name, Tugji Chenpo. So you'll be able to scroll it up, will you, Jason, as you go along? Yeah. Okay, then this will this will be this will finish as often. It's just nearly nine o'clock now. Singambu ayo, Om Vajra Bhumi Aho, Manchen Sagi Saji, 
Om Vajrakeyahu Chichari Koyogi Kawayasu Rijal Puri Rab Shalu Papol Hosambulin Hubalancha Tran Yamena Ludan Lupa Nyayab Dan Yayab Zen Yandan Dan Long Chodro Dramin Yandan Dramin Yangeda Rimbo Cheri O Pa Sangishin Dujiba Mamo Bahi Loto Korlo Rimbo Che Norbu Rimbo Che Simmo Rimbo Che Lumpo Rimbo Che Langpo Rimbo Che Dacho Rimbo Che Makpun Rimbo Che Te Chien Bo Yi Bumba Keg Ma Treng Wa Ma Lu Ma Gar Ma Maito Ma Dupu Ma Nam Sa Ma Dri Cha Ma Ni Ma Da Wa Rimbo Che Du Chola Nama Gya Wa Gya Tsen Du Su La Da Mi Pa Jo Pun Sun So Pa Ma San Wa Ma Pa Sang Ching Yi Du Wong Wa Di Dar Jin Chen Sa Wa Dang Yo Pa Che Pe Pe Dan La Ma Dan Ma Kye Pe Du Yang Pa Pa Chuk Tu Che Chen Pu La So Ko Dan Che Pa Nam Na Jin Ngam Bo Wa Gyo Tu Je Dro Wa Dun Du Je Zu Se Je Ne Kyang Da So Dro Wa Ma Gyo Nang Khe Ta Dan Yen Pe Sam Chen Tam Che La so se wa chen po go ne jing ki la tu sa sa si pa ki juk si ma to shram ri ra blin ji ni da So one verse of dedication then. Bodhicitta precious mind, where not born may it be born, where born may it not decline, only increase more and more. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Gitula. See you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.